Amen. Thanks, Garrett. Um, if you're new here, my name is Scott Brooks. I'm the lead pastor on the teaching team here at the Door Church. So glad that you're here this morning. And you're probably thinking, man, I like your shirt. And I, I just want to say thank you. Um, and you can grab one of these shirts just right outside these doors. Uh, if you miss the announcements, this helps feed uh, hungry uh, people. And so we have a food packing event coming up, and our part of our DNA is to be other, other people focused. And so we want to bring the gospel, yes, in word, but also deed. And so um, when we want to display the love of Christ in action. And this is one of the tangible ways uh, that we do that corporately in the hopes that every day that we would live with the mind of Christ, considering other people more important than ourselves. And so uh, please, if you would buy a T-shirt, it would help uh, feed people in need. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it. We'll be in John 10, 1 through 9, as we'll be out this morning. John 10, 1 through 9. Uh, we are doing the I Am series. Jesus says, I am. Um, this is who Jesus claims to be, I am. And then the question is, who do you say that he is? And so as we uh, look to uh, John 10, I'm just going to set the stage for the series. Jesus says, I am, seven times in the book of John. And I am is the language of God. So Jesus over and over is claiming to be God. So uh, we believe that uh, Jesus became man, God became man and dwelt among us, and he proclaimed to be God. And so uh, this was a, an affront uh, to this culture. Why? Because he was 30-something, and he's looking at people that understood what I am means. He's saying, I am. And so uh, they didn't like hearing that. Can you imagine a 30-something-year-old man saying, you know, I'm God? And they're like, no, I don't know, man. You look like you're 30. Uh, but this is what he was claiming to be. Uh, he was saying, before uh, Moses, I, I am. Before, before Abraham, I'm, I'm before Abraham. I am God. This is, when we say I am statements, it's a claim to be divine. Uh, and then he goes on in seven, di seven different ways, statements, to, to give a self-disclosure to the character of God, imagery of God. And so all these together, you kind of you see who God is. It says in Colossians 1, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 15, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So he's, he's displaying God to us. And so these I am statements, he wants you to know him. God wants a relationship with you. And he gets to define who he is. We don't get to define who he is. God uh, is claim, Jesus is claiming to be God. He's defining who he is. And he wants you to respond to him in faith and submission and love and following him to know him. So Jesus saying I am is dis uh, displaying, uh, self-disclosing who he is. Now, this is, this, this truth claim, Jesus is claiming to be God, uh, was not met with just open arms uh, by his people. It's what got him killed. Uh, they, they did not accept this. This claim was offensive to the worldview at hand. Now, this reminds me, Jesus says, I am. Who, who do we say that he is? is uh, who do we say that he is? Is John, or Matthew 16, where Jesus comes to his disciples and says, who, who do you say that I am? It's a good question. Jesus, it's a question that we all have to answer. Who do you say that I am? Uh, and the disciples were like, well, hey, some people, hey, they, think you're, they think you're Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the great prophets. This is what people, you, clearly you're different. You speak of one who has authority, who's been with God, speaking for God, doing miracles. You're clearly different. People are talking about you, Jesus. And then Jesus turns again and asks him, but who do you say that I am? And that's when Simon Peter goes, man, you're the Christ, son of the living God. And that's when Jesus said, man, uh, God has revealed this to you, not man. And then Jesus told Peter on this confession, on this profession of truth, that Jesus is the Messiah, son of the living God, that he, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Under this profession, this claim that Jesus says, I am the Messiah, the son of the living God. He says, the church, that's what we are if you're in Christ, will, 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 will stand in the gates of hell won't prevail against it. That we, in Christ, should be pushing back on darkness, the gates of hell, through the truth of who Jesus says he is. So when we say, I am, we want to look at how Jesus, uh, uh, how he, who he claims to be, which is God, but how he discloses himself. Then the question is, who do we say that he is? Will we come under it? You will either receive or reject this morning the truth of what uh, Christ uh, says, uh, who he says he, he is. You will submit or stiffen your neck. Um, but you will respond to the claims of Christ. So let's read John 10, 1 through 9. This is where Jesus proclaims, I am the door. So uh, John 10, 1 through 9, we're going to read it. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he, but he who enters by the door is the sheepfold. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, he is, I'm sorry, I got lost. That man is the thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the strangers. So the, the, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand uh, what he was saying to them. Verse 7, so Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus saying, I am God. And he says, I am the door. Now, if you were not, per, you know, perceptive, you were in a church, <laughs> a church congregation that says, we are the door church, right? You entered a building that has the door on it. So this is... Uh, the, the passage, the mission of the door church. Jesus is the door. And if you don't know how that came about, uh, was really about 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, uh, I was, so God saved me in college. I gotta make a long story very short. God saved me uh, out of my sin into a right relationship with, him, with himself through Christ. Um, gave me a new heart, new affection. I was very into the world, very into baseball. God saved me, gave me an appetite to know the Word of God, to know Him. Just started just to read the Word of God. Graduated from ACU. Yeah, they beat Texas. I don't even really care, but that's true. They did beat Texas uh, last night, but I'm really getting sidetracked here. Uh, met my wife there, got a finance degree uh, from there. And you know what? I was saved, loved Jesus, and I was like, I'm going to go make money. Uh, I was at a men's conference, and man, I felt as a guy was preaching that God was calling me out of the, the work world, so to speak, into to, to ministry. Uh, is, it, I felt like God was speaking to me, is clear, went home, talked to my wife, say, hey, went to the men's conference. I felt like God is laying on my heart to go into ministry. Tears started to flow down her face, not of joy, uh, of scared, timidness, and like, I don't know about that, right? Uh, and so, you know what? I felt if God called me there, he's certainly gonna call my wife there. So we didn't make any moves. We just prayed about it. And over time, God man, made it clear this was the calling not only for my life, but our life. Uh, she's like, this is, this is good, right? And what we should be doing. So I started going to seminary, started working for that church. Uh, ended up going to the Village Church, which was at Highland Village uh, then, not, not in Farmville, but early on. And uh, man, just wanted to follow the Lord. I was about to graduate seminary, praying God with Marcy one evening. He's like, God, what do you want me to do? I'm more than happy uh, to go into ministry, to, to be in ministry, or to, to go back to, to work in the, the work world, because I actually love to work, uh, or, you know, plant a church. Like, whatever you want, God, I'm in on that. And so I was just praying with my wife because, you know, next step, you graduate, you got to do something. Eventually, you got to get a job. And um, praying. And God, man, in a dream, just laid two words in my brain, the door, the door, the door, the door. I'm like, okay. And so I woke up, and I was like, man, maybe I ate some bad food. You know, obviously, I remember praying with Marcy, God, be clear. I felt like I was maybe wrestling with God or the sheets. I'm not sure what was happening. And so I woke up that morning, and by God's providence, I was in John chapter 10. And I was just reading about Jesus being the door to salvation, to life. I mean, I just felt a conviction in, 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 in this call to preach Jesus as the door. It was a burden. It's our mission. Now, we're going to lay out how that mission plays out but in, in the context of this. But, man, this is the calling of the door church. I mean, we, we want to proclaim Jesus as the door. So I'm going to... I've outlined it in three different ways as we looked at this in uh, John 10, 9, the thesis statement. It gives us some, some really helpful things. I just want to read one more time. It says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will be saved. He comes through the door, which is Jesus. It says, I am, I am that door. If anyone comes to me, he'll be saved. Uh, and then it goes on uh, to, to say that that. And, and we'll go in and out and find pasture. He will have life. There's a, there's a life, abundant life in Christ. So there's two things I want us to see in John 10, 9. One, 
Salvation only comes through Jesus Christ as the door. That's what's being said. It's very, very narrow, very clear. And there's only life, true life found in Jesus Christ. Salvation and abundant life in no other name, no other person, no other philosophy besides Jesus Christ. So the words that I wrote down here is Jesus proclaiming to be the door helps us because it's, it brings clarity and not confusion. In a world that is so confused, we don't have to be confused where salvation lies. Jesus Christ saying, I am God, I am God, and the interest, entrance to salvation and life. There's clarity. There's no confusion. Our mission should not be confused. It, and Jesus states it super clear. I am the only way to God. You can only enter through me for salvation and true life. So clarity. I want us as the door church, if you, if you call this your home, if you're visiting, we are super clear on who we believe Jesus is and our mission, that he is the way to salvation and the way to true life. Now, I want to I want to talk about this because Jesus determines himself. This is what he's saying. He's saying this is the only way to salvation in life. I, I, I heard Jason Mulkin preach probably about, I don't know, probably six, seven months ago now. But he had a good illustration that Jesus, he's saying Jesus is the only way to salvation, the only way to true life. If I ran into a burning house, and he, this is his illustration, and I'm sure you heard it somewhere else, but I liked it. If I went to a burning house, I saw maybe kids in a back room, and I know only through the front door is the only way out. But all the windows are, are burned up, all the back door, no, not everything else is going to end in disaster, destruction. And I ran in there and said, hey, follow me, follow me, I know the way out. And, and they're like, you know what, uh, I'm going to try some other ways. It, would it be loving or unloving? Like, no, 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 you can't go that way. You go that way, you're going to burn up. You won't get out. There's only one way, and that's through this door. Would it be loving or unloving to, to say you need this way, to proclaim this way, to shepherd them through the door? That'd be, that'd be loving, right? Well, we don't want them to burn up. Like, we are for kids. We're for life. It'd be very loving to say if Jesus is the only way to salvation, to be super clear about it. You shouldn't be like, man, I don't know. You could be right. No, no, we're not going to say that. There's only one way to God. And that's through the door, which is Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6, Jesus says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Listen, no one, no one's come to the Father except to me. He's the door. Now, what I like here, we're going to go through this here, so I'm going to go through it quickly. But I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to lay some of these down. I'm going to start with the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth here. Now, Jesus, if he's the only way to salvation. This is true. Now, this is a affront to our culture. We live in a postmodern world, and, and there's a guy who used to work on staff, 11 to, Beth, 11 to Death. He always used to say, and it was a joke, we'd, we'd be talking about something, usually facts. It's like, well, who's to say? <laughs> and that, that's what the world does. Like, hey, you say something that's true. Like, well, who's really to say? Are you sure? You say, you say this, I say this. Who's really to say? This is what the world will say today. There is really no truth. It's only your perspective of truth. There's no really reality. And Jesus says, no, I am capital T truth. Another thing, when Jesus says I'm the truth, there's a lot of fake news. And you're like, oh, that seems political. It's not. Both sides are fake. I don't even know what's true anymore. Why? Because everyone's just speaking their opinion. No one's speaking facts. They're not reporting on historical things that happened. They're speaking their opinions. They should be opinion polls. But really, it's not news. It's opinions. Right? There is truth, though. There is truth in Jesus Christ. There's something called vantage point epistemology, where someone will say, well, my experience is my truth. And somewhat that's true. Your experience does, does matter. Your feelings does matter. Uh, what's happening to you does help to, you know, show certain parts of reality, but it's not the truth. That's why so often, as Rayton said a few weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago I really don't care what you think. And you're like, well, and, and that's, that's overstated, right? I do, I do care what you think. Uh, and I do care what you feel. But it's not the ultimate truth. Like your feelings, your experience is not capital T truth. See, the culture today is ever shifting on this truth. Uh, if you go to university, they have all kinds. They say, here's, here's, here's the truth of the way the world is now. You got your parents' truth. You got your, gra your grandparents' truth. Um, I hear a lot today, too. It's like, man, 
You don't want to be on the wrong side of history, right? Because you're battling what's true. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> you, may, you may be on the right side of history, be on the wrong side of God. God is truth. Jesus is truth. He determines truth. He creates and sustains. He determines. We do not determine. So when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth, he is the only door. There's only one way to God. In that, in that John 14, 6, he says he's the way. The way, like I said, it's very loving to tell someone that Jesus is the only way to God. It's narrow. There's no other way. Right? Again, again, loving or unloving, if this is the only way to salvation, the only way to forgiveness, the only way to, to eternal life is through Jesus. Is it unloving or loving to tell them about Jesus? It is so loving See, this is the only way that you can be forgiven, to, to have life, to, to be known by God is through Jesus Christ. The way, though, is narrow. Truth is narrow. All truth is narrow. If you believe something and I believe something, if we disagree, man, your truth is just as narrow as mine. So well, I don't believe Jesus is the way. Well, that's a narrow truth. It's, we're going to disagree fundamentally on, on the way, but all truth is narrow. Now, what Jesus Christ is saying when he says he's the way, it's a loving thing. He says, come follow me. I want you to be forgiven. I want you to have life. I want you to be known. I want, I want you to be saved. It's a loving thing to share. But furthermore, if Jesus Christ is our truth, that doesn't mean that we have to be right. Why? Because Jesus is our righteousness. And so he, here's what I mean by that. You should evaluate someone's truth, which everyone lives by something. Everyone has a narrow truth. If they say they don't, they say, oh, I'm open-minded. No, whatever they believe is narrow. The way that you evaluate someone's truth is how does it lead them to treat someone that they disagree with? Like if someone doesn't agree that Jesus Christ is Lord, he's not the way, I'm still going to love them. I'm still going to respect them. I'm still going to care about them. I'm not going to cancel them. Why? They're image bearers of God. God cares about them. Even if they don't believe, even if they're stuck in their blindness, our response to them is love, compassion, and kindness. Why? Because one way that we have, have salvation is not that we're better than them. It's only through Christ. So, man, our truth should lead to great compassion to people that, that, that are very different than us. Not, we don't cancel people. That's very popular. You don't agree with me? Cancel. Jesus doesn't cancel people. We act in compassion. Now, this is unique because this is not how most people think. And this is kind of a sidetrack, but I was driving with Deacon the other day because he doesn't understand really the truth of Christ, the truth of God. He saw someone have a nice car. He's like, man, I'd like to take them out and take their car. No lie, seven years old. He's like, buddy, that's not nice. You know, uh, you don't want to take them out and take their car. God cares about them. He's like, but what if they're bad people? That'd be okay then, right, Dad? And I was like, not okay. Not okay. Why? Even if they're bad, still image bearer of God. God cares about them. He's like, mm. so that, that's where we need to grow in, right? People that are bad in our own opinion, People that we disagree with, image bearers of God that we care about, that we want to love and serve and not cancel. Jesus is the door to eternal life. Now, that's the truth, that's the way, and this is life. This should drive us. If you found life in Jesus Christ, you found forgiveness, you found joy, you found meaning and purpose, which comes in Christ. You know there's a, a, the world apart from Jesus is stuck in their sin. They're stuck in brokenness, meaningless hopelessness, despair, frustration. Why? And just say, man, not only am I way to salvation, I'm the way to life. Uh, you, you are made, you are made to know your maker through Jesus. You will, not be sat you will not be satisfied in this world until you know Jesus. You just won't because nothing in this world will satisfy your heart. You weren't made for this world. Not that you can't enjoy it, but you're made for God. And so Jesus is saying, well, I'm the only way to salvation. I'm the only way you can truly have life. That is crystal clear. And Jesus wants you to know that. That's why Jesus says, I am the door. He doesn't want you to be confused. He doesn't want you to sit there being, I wonder what this is all about. Jesus says, I am the way to salvation. Come through me. Come through me. He's beckoning through clarity. Man, I'm the way to salvation and to life. That is the door, Jesus. Now, another thing is Jesus saying, I am the door brings clarity, not confusion, brings compassion, not comparison. And so in the context, which matters for our church and the scripture, 
Jesus is speaking when he's saying, I am the door, he's speaking to people. And the question is, who is he speaking to? So if you don't know your Bible, you don't know this passage, as Jesus says, I am the door, who is he talking to? In John 9, he heals a blind man, a blind man for birth. A blind person in that day is a beggar, it says that in John 9. He's marginalized, the outside uh, of, of community, right? He's the marginalized, the down and out, the least of these, blind man. And Jesus heals a, a, a blind man. And then some of the disciples were asked, he's like, hey, was this, was this person uh, blind because of some sin that he did? Or was this a parent's sin? And they're trying to figure out why this guy's physically blind. And Jesus responds, it's not because of his sin in particular or uh, uh, the sins of his, his parents. Uh, but, man, this is to show the work of God. Now, this blind man represents a humble person, a needy person, not only physically but spiritually. We are brought into this world because of Adam and sin that we are broken, that we are spiritually blind. And so Jesus heals this blind man. And so now he sees, and then the Pharisees, these are religious leaders, these are the preachers of the day, the scholars of the day, come and say, hey, yeah, we, we know you were blind, but how are you seeing? He's like, I, I don't know. Jesus healed me. And then they go get his parents. They're like, man, I don't know if he was really blind. So they talk to his parents. Like, hey, was he really blind? I mean, was this kind of a, like a, a stunt? And he's like, no, he was really blind. But I don't know how he sees. He's of age. You need to go talk to him. Because they don't want any part of the Pharisees because they're getting mad because it's proclaiming Christ. So they go back to him and say, hey, how, how can you see? And he's like, man, do you want to worship him too? And then, then they get real angry. Uh, and then, they, they, then Jesus comes to him and, and, and proclaims that he's the Messiah. And then he, he becomes a worshiper of God. So God heals his physical blindness but then unveils his spiritual blindness. And he, he starts to worship Jesus. Now, the context of Jesus saying, I am the door, he looks at the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and he says, you think you, you can see, but you're blind. You think that you're in, but you're out. You have not entered through the door because you're entering through your good works, you're entering through your, your pedigree, you're entering through your nationality, you're relying on the law, you're not relying on me. You think you're good but you're not good. You think you can see, but you're blind. And then he's looking at the Pharisees, the churchgoers, and saying, I am the door. It's not being good. It's not going to church. It's only through me. So Jesus saying, I am the door, is out of compassion, not comparison. Comparison doesn't get you into heaven. Only Christ gets you in to, uh, is the only way to salvation. So the only qualification to become a Christian, listen, is to understand your neediness, to understand your blindness, that you can't save yourself. If Jesus came into the world and you could save yourself, Jesus came for nothing. The only way, the only way is through the door. To become a Christian is actually the only way is you got to be humbled. You got to have humility to understand that you don't measure up. In Matthew 5, 3, it says this, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The only people that understand that, 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 that will, that, frankly, the only people that will be saved is the only people that, 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 that know they need it. When it says blessed is the poor in spirit, it's blessed, blessed not of the good people. Not, not, it doesn't say blessed are the churchgoers. Blessed of, you know, the Jewish heritage. Blessed are what? The poor in spirit. The people that understand they are spiritually bankrupt. The people that understand they have nothing to bring to God. They're not good enough. The people that understand that, they, they will receive salvation. You need help. You need help. You need an intervention from God. See, the only sin that's unforgivable is the proud because you don't think you need Jesus. You got to be humble to be saved. You, they think they can see, but you're blind. This is the heart. Hear me, this is the heart of the door church. We want to convert the converted. The people who think they're good apart from Jesus Christ, they may be in, they may, they may be near Christ, they may have heard about Christ, but they're not in Christ by faith alone. They think Christianity is like, man, I gotta be good. I gotta clean myself up. You know, I, I grew up in church, I was baptized. No, you know, only thing that brings you salvation is Christ. Our aim is to convert the converted. It is this idea to say, even on your best day, you're not good enough. And not only do you gotta repent of your sin, you gotta repent of your self-righteousness. The only thing that you bring to Christianity, listen, is your sin. That's it. It's like, I'm gonna give Jesus my sin. He paid for it all on the cross. And what we get is salvation, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Listen, if that's not how you've come, you're not a Christian. Why? Because you haven't entered through the door. 
Jesus alone, Christ alone, by faith alone. It's not you and Jesus, it's just Jesus. Now, that's why uh, we do no perfect people around here. Like, what's that all about? Because you're not perfect. Jesus is your per- perfection. He is your righteousness. And as we pr- proclaim to the church that they need Christ, man, there's a humility that comes in the church. Why? Because you start to realize it's not that you're better than anyone, that you're actually needy just like everyone else, but you found Christ. There's a humility that will come into your life if you actually turn uh, to Jesus Christ. Now, when you preach Jesus, as you afflict the comfortable, the righteous people apart from Christ, you start to reach the deep the, the de- church, the people that have given up on church. There's a lot of people like, oh, I've tried Christianity, it just didn't work for me. That's never true. They may try to be good enough, they may try to quit their sin, they may try to, to clean themselves up. That doesn't work. Christ always works. But Christ isn't always proclaimed or modeled by the church. As, as the church, the, the converted, actually come to conversion in Jesus Christ, there's a humility that, that starts to woo the people who have given up on Christ that were on that performance treadmill for, and they just stepped off. It's like, man, this doesn't work. They start to be wooed back in. It's like, that's different. It's not about me. It's about Christ. And then what happens is the, the, the people that never been to church see, man, this new community being formed by the Spirit of God, and they start to be interested in Christ. Why, why do you love this way? Why are you humble? Why, are you, why do you not cancel people? Why do you act in compassion? Why do, you, why do you love people? This is all, what, proclaiming Jesus is the door. It converts the converted, it woos the de church, and it reaches the unchurched. Simply proclaiming the door. We have seen the fruit of this for years, and I praise God for it. Fruit of this. We've seen the, com- the people who thought they were good, actually come unto the righteousness of Christ. We've seen the converted actually converted unto Christ. I mean, over and over and over again, every time we hear a baptism, I'm almost like, I thought I was a Christian, but I wasn't. I grew up in church, but I didn't understand the relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't understand. I thought it was about being good. I thought Jesus was a second chance, not a savior. And God saved them. We understand it's about him. It's not about us. Again, we try to model this when we say there's no perfect people. I remember early on preaching through this passage, like, listen, I ain't perfect. I mean, I struggle with thoughts, actions, motivations. I mean, you followed me for a week. You'd be like, man, I don't want him to be my pastor. And, you're like, and everyone's like, whoa, my goodness, what is he doing? Right? No, that's confession. I'm not perfect. Jesus is. And I need Jesus. I need salvation. I need the Holy Spirit to save me and to sanctify me. I want to confess my sin, to put it in the light and put it to death. Because I can't save myself. That, that's, that's Christ alone. We've seen D church get up here. It's like, I mean, I grew up in church, so I gave up. I gave up on him. But I didn't really understand it was the gospel. I thought I was always trying to be better. The only problem is I couldn't be better. We've seen the unchurch come in, living missionally. We've seen our church live missionally. We've seen people come from different religions under Christ. We've seen people, man, that battle drug addictions, witchcraft, all kinds of different walks of life come under Christ, simply preaching Jesus is the door. Jesus is, listen, Jesus is not the door for good people. He is the door for people who know they are not good and they need salvation in Christ. That's what he came for, the blind, which is you. You can't see apart from Jesus Christ. You have to humble yourself to be a Christian. Now, so this brings, hopefully, compassion. Uh, Then furthermore, courage, not compromise. The mission of the door church has not changed in 10 years. It was fun last night, Tristan Swire was leading, who was a part of our church early on, still is, was our worship minister. As I said, the mission hasn't changed in 10 years. He's like shaking his head. He's like, that's right. It hadn't changed. Know why? Because it hasn't. We're still doing the same thing. One trick pony. We got Jesus. I mean, we exist to see restored lives with the gospel for God's glory. We're going to proclaim Christ. He is is the door. Now, the vision has been expanded. Know why? Because we didn't have a lot of vision. Vision's God's. Like, we're just walking by faith. I mean, early on, it's like, hey, what's your plan? No, we're on the no plan plan. That's where we're at. We're just trying to preach Christ, right? The door church and raise up disciples. That, that was our goal. Jesus, make disciples. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's what we want to do. So I remember year one, literally no money in the bank account, nowhere to meet. And it was like, ah, you're going to preach the door. Okay. Well, God, you're going to have to provide. He did. I mean, we met in a church called Metro Crest Community Church on Saturday evenings in a strip center. It was awesome because it was free. It was not awesome because it didn't have our church on there, our name, which is fine. Uh, and it had no air conditioning, and we didn't have anything. But it was free. And that's where we met. We preached Christ. You know what God did? He started to draw himself. People to the door. That was, that was year one. Five years in, you know, we started to, you know, we're one through five. We started meeting at a church, Say Sarum. 
which is a Korean Methodist church. Pastor Kong's an amazing man. Finally got, let us meet on Sunday mornings, but we had Korean writing all over there. Had one gathering, two gatherings, three gatherings. How did all that happen? Jesus is the door. Now, if you're like, hey, Scott, what was your vision? Do you want to meet in another church and go to a Korean Methodist church? That's not, that wasn't our vision. We didn't have vision. We're like, God, we need help. We're going to walk by faith. And then around year seven, we moved into this facility. That was not my vision. No vision. You know where my vision was? Capel. I want to stay in Capel. Looked in Capel. Wanted to buy in Capel. I want to be in Capel. And they're like, man, why, why are you hating on Louisville? Why are you hating on Louisville? Not. That just wasn't the vision. But this is where we ended up, in Louisville. And God has drawn people from Louisville, Grapevine, Carrollton. God had a bigger vision than what I had. What the elders had, the pastors had. And then, year 10, we planted a campus. Not my vision. Someone came up to me <laughs> 10 years ago. Y'all going to have a campus? I like, no. I, I don't know if we'll be here. I remember the first time I preached. Marcy, because she's in kids, because we needed help in kids. We still do. We get, sign up for kids, love on them, right? Uh, she was like, how'd it go? I was like, I don't know. We got through it. She's like, anybody, anybody going to come back next week? Probably not. Uh, the aim was not a big vision. It was to be faithful. But year 10, man, we ended up having two campuses. How did that happen? Brad Larson is now the campus pastor out, out in Argyle. He's, he's been here since day one. Uh, you know, I don't know how you say it. Founding member, first elder. God started to land his heart, man, I want to raise up and preach Jesus, raise up leaders. I mean, I want to, I want to plant a church. I want to be, a, I feel like God's calling me here. I was like, great, pray about it. I mean, if you want to plant a church, we support that. We'll send you out. I was like, if you want to be a campus, great. He prayed about it. He's like, man, I love the mission of the Door Church. I love the DNA of the Door Church. Man, I want, I want to be a campus. That was, we, the elders were praying about it too. But man, we want to support what God's doing. So we don't, we, this is God's vision. It's amazing what God has done. And so we're now at two campuses. Vision has expanded, man, to see lives restored with the gospel. We're simply proclaiming Christ is the door. We're better together. We want to convert the converter. We're doing the same thing here as the same thing over there. So how this functionally works now is, man, we have a teaching team. So Drayton Shanks is the campus pastor. His main role is he's on the preaching team, and, man, he shepherds the, the, the sheep. Brad Larson is on the preaching team. And his main thing is he's on the preaching team and he shepherds the sheep. We have elders that, that shepherd uh, both campuses. My main role is I'm on the preaching team overseeing preaching. And, man, I want to love on the sheep. Man, Steve Dressler's role is really to bring, make sure we're staying calibrated on our mission better together. That's a full-time job, <laughs> trying to sync up. But we believe we're better together. We have the same mission, same DNA, gospel-centered, community-driven, other people-focused. We're doing the same, the same sermon uh, Argyle here. We're doing the same students, Argyle here. We're doing the same, right now, kids ministry, same message here and there. Why? We're better together. Same discipleship groups. This is, this is, but this is God's, we're just walking by faith. So you're like, what happens five years? I don't know. <laughs> That's right. I don't know. God knows. Walk by faith. We may have another campus. We may roll off that campus. I don't know. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now this is important. It is important that God would give us courage to follow his vision. Because some people are like, man, you may get in too big for your britches. And I'd say maybe we just want to be courageous because we are, we are dying people. I'm a dying man preaching to dying people. You know what you need? You need salvation in Jesus Christ. You need life in Jesus Christ. And that's everyone that has breath in the lungs. What I like in John 9 verse 4, it says, because the disciples were asking this question, it says, we must work. We must work the works of him who sent me while his day, now he's coming, when no one can work anymore. There's only a short amount of time. There will be a day where there will be no more, more time for repentance. There will be a day where Christ will return and the people that, that, that don't know him, they're going to they're gonna suffer judgment. They'll be left apart from him. We have the message of the door. The door. Jesus is the way to salvation. We got time. I pray that God would give us courage to walk by faith, not, not by sight, to proclaim the entrance into salvation to life. I mean, if that doesn't get you fired up, I don't know what will. You know people that need to know Jesus. And they, they, are, they are stuck in their sins, stuck, alienated from God, not having life apart from Christ. We, we, have, we have the best news ever, which is Jesus Christ. 
I love what it says in Ephesians 3.20. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ask or think according to the power at work within us. I mean, think about that. God wants to do more than we could ask or think according to the power at work within us. I, I don't know even what to think or ask, but God does. And it's a privilege to walk by faith and not by sight, to walk courageously. You know why? Because the mission is worth it. Did you know that? It's worth it. People meeting Jesus is absolutely worth it. And, and I pray that we would have courage to follow him, to preach Jesus is the door. Let's pray. God, I pray that you help us live on mission. I pray that you help us believe the mission of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the door to salvation. I pray, God, that you would allow us through Jesus' self-disclosure that you give us clarity, that we don't have to, to wonder how to be saved. It comes through Christ and Christ alone. Not us, not us, but something else. It's just Christ. Help us have this clear conviction, this calling, this burden to proclaim Christ and him crucified. I pray that we'd have compassion for people that don't know him. A compassion as Jesus has compassion for people. He wants, he came to seek and save the lost, to heal the blind. God, help us model humility and love that he has so graciously given up his life for our life. I pray that you would give us courage to walk by faith, courage to follow you. Whatever your vision is, not only for our church corporately, but individually, it is worth it. You, you don't know your five-year plan just as we don't know the Door Church organization five-year plan, I pray that you would have the courage to walk by faith and not by sight. I ask that in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.